Good afternoon, good morning, whatever time it is, I do hope that you're having a good time. I'm Andrew Kalmazinski. This is the second in a series of lectures for a course on critical thinking that is being taught in a flipped format. If you're one of the students at the class here, this is the first lecture that I'm asking you to watch as homework. So I want to give credit where it's due. Many of the ideas in this class originate with Anthony Weston's A Rule Book for Critical Thinking. I've made several changes to adapt it to as an English mediated instruction course and one that is suitable for EFL. Um, this has involved simplifying some of the terms, but I don't think I'm losing anything important. So I would say that I am adding clarity by making this so that people who are non-native speakers can also follow along. So this is a English version of the text that this is originally based on, and this is a Japanese version of the text. So here are some of the basic concepts that we'll be looking at this week. So argue versus assert. So I want to draw a distinction between arguing and asserting. I want to talk really briefly about justification. By justification, I mean how we support or how we make sense of a reason for an argument. I want to talk about convincing. So our goal is to convince the people that we're dealing with of the truth of what we want to say, our conclusion. I'm going to briefly mention deductive and inductive, but we're going to cover those in a lot more detail later in the semester, so if you don't understand them, that's fine. I also want to define statement and claim for you and talk about premises and conclusions. So we're going to do two things in critical thinking. We are going to be evaluating arguments. We're also going to be making arguments. When we are evaluating arguments, the point is to find the premises and the conclusion, to understand justifications and learn how to read things kindly. When we are making our own arguments, we want to look at how to properly structure these arguments, how to provide good justifications, and how to write them clearly. So again, when we evaluate, we want to find this sort of structure. When we make our own arguments, we want to generate this sort of structure. So. I want to mention what I said about asserting and arguing. So the word assert in English often has a very negative meaning. It means to state or declare forcefully and to do so without support or reason. Conversely, to argue is to give justification to convince others our position is true. On this point, and on many points in this class, please be very careful. If you look these words up in your dictionary, you can find all sorts of other meanings. So, for instance, one meaning of argue is to come to loggerheads, to be arguing and angry with someone. That is not the meaning that we're working from here. In this sense, we mean to argue is to use logic to support the things that we want to say. So, the main benefit of arguing in this way is that we can defend the conclusions and explain them to others. The arguments we make generalize the things we say. In this way, argumentation is convincing in the public sphere. And by convince, I mean we can cause someone to believe firmly in the truth of something. So, critical thinking works by understanding language as arguments. In this context, argument will mean a sequence of statements, of which one is intended as a conclusion and the others support the conclusion, and we call these premises. Arguments are a method of inquiry with the goal of leading us to the truth, or at a minimum, they provide a way of finding out which views are better supported than other views. They make it clear which ones you can argue for in ways that people can understand. So logical arguments have this very important function. They help us to handle disagreements in an objective way. So this is one of the most important concepts that I will mention to you. A statement is something that can be either true or false. Consequently, we usually say them as declarative sentences, though not always. But let me explain more what I mean. Something that can be either true or false. The sky is blue. So on most days, the sky is blue. On most days, this is a true statement. But it's a statement because it could be true, it could be false. At night, the sky is not blue. The sky is yellow. Also a statement. This is a false statement. If your sky is yellow, you are not on the same planet as us, or there's something terrible happening. But this is still a statement. How are you? This is not a statement. Why? What's true about this? What's false about this? To say how are you is merely to ask a question that can have more than one possible answer. Gosh, or ouch, or any of a number of other exclamations are not statements. These are things that you just utter where they don't have any meaning. So a lot of swear words in some uses are not statements. Let's try it with these. So we have ouch. 
What do you think? What is your name? The sun is blue. The sky is red. Hawaii is a part of Japan. Dr. K has two feet. And when is the homework due? So, ouch, not a statement. What is your name? Not a statement. Not a yes or no question. Doesn't have a true or false meaning by itself. The sun is blue. Statement. It's a false statement. Sky is red. Statement. Often a false statement. Hawaii is a part of Japan. False. Therefore a statement. Dr. K has two feet. True. Therefore a statement. When is the homework due? This is not a statement. All right, how do we know? Easy question. Is this something that can be true or can be false? It doesn't matter whether it is true or false. It matters whether it can be true or false. So these statements are going to be divided into two categories. One is a conclusion. A conclusion is the statement you are trying to prove is true. The premises are the statements you believe are true that can serve as the basis or support for a further proof, i.e. for your conclusion. So the idea is that we have a series of premises, then we have a conclusion. The conclusion is going to be what we're trying to prove. So here's a definition of logical. It's a little bit hard, but I want to walk us through it because I think that there are things that we can improve on compared to this definition. So logical, of or according to the rules of logic or formal argument. This is not very helpful. This does not tell us what these rules are. Uses sound reasoning. Again, not amazingly helpful. This does not tell us what sound reasoning is of an action development decision, etc., natural or sensible given the circumstances. Again, not amazingly helpful. So in this context, we could say it's a logical progression from the job before, meaning it moves us forward. Something is logical in the purposes of our class if the meaning of each part is clear, the parts are connected, the order of the parts easily leads to the conclusion, and the role of each premise supports the conclusion. So, those are our four main things. This is important. I will repeat this on many slides. Something is logical if the meaning of each part is clear. The parts are connected. The order of the parts easily leads to the conclusion. And the role of each premise supports the conclusion. So, this is a very important distinction. This is something many students have had trouble with, so I want to bring it up and to make sure we understand it. A statement is one claim that is either true or false. An argument is several statements taken together. This means that an argument is not one statement. An argument is many statements. Could be one, two, three, four, five. It doesn't matter. Here's an analogy. So let's say that we're talking about sports. If statements are the individual players, arguments are the teams. So several players together are not one player. They combine as one team. So the team and the players are different. So one person can be in good health or bad health. One person can have a heart attack. A team as a whole cannot have a heart attack. Same idea here. Statements are true or false. Arguments are not. So I'm going to give you some more detail on that. So if we have a statement, the statement can be true, can be false. If we have an argument, it cannot be true, it cannot be false. If we have a conclusion, it can be true, it can be false. If we have an argument, it cannot be true, it cannot be false. If we have a premise, again, true, false. Again, an argument cannot be true or false. That's something that applies to each statement in the argument. This idea will be very important. Please try to learn and understand this. So I'm going to start by just giving you some interesting arguments, and I'm going to make some comments about them. Ice cream is cold, therefore let's eat yakiniku, asekawa is in Hokkaido. This does not follow any of the rules of a good argument. None of the premises are connected, the order is bad, the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises, there are things moving around a lot, there's barely anything going on here. So let's look at one that's a little bit better, but still not good. Ice cream is cold, it is hot in the summer, therefore let's drink milkshakes. So using our minds, we can figure out that there is some connection between cold and hot, but this is not in the conclusion. But one other improvement is now the order of our argument is better. Now we have our conclusion in an easier to find place. And I'll explain that in more detail in the next video. So now let's make it more logical. So ice cream is cold, it is hot in the summer, therefore let's eat ice cream. This is much better. We now have ice cream, we have hot, and we have ice cream again, and we have cold and hot, so we have some patterns that we can work from. This is very much improved from the previous one. So I'm going to give you a couple of sample arguments. If carbon emissions will go up, then the ice caps will melt. Carbon emissions will go up, therefore the ice caps will melt. This is a very well-formed argument. 
It actually doesn't matter whether you think any of this is true. It matters that the argument is well formed. So I'll talk about this format a lot later in the class. This is a sample of a deductive argument. This is the style of claims that a deductive argument has. It has two premises in this case and one conclusion. This is what we often would call a syllogism. So this is a very old style argument. So I will explain this in more detail in a future class. This is another sample argument. Building a Disneyland near Tokyo increased traffic to Chiba. Disneyland Hong Kong increased local traffic. Therefore, building a Disneyland in Asekawa will probably increase traffic on the Hokkaido Expressway. So, this is also a very common type of argument, which we'll talk about more in the last part of the semester. This is an inductive argument, but this is also a well-structured argument. This has two things that are true, and it uses these to talk about something that is probably true if these are true. Again, it has two premises, and it leads to its conclusion using this logic. So, there are some questions I often get that I wanted to mention and provide some information about at this point in this video. What about sentences like, I like? So let's say the sentence, I like McDonald's. These sentences raise interesting questions. So I want to talk about why they raise interesting questions by comparing Dr. K is 183 centimeters tall with Dr. K likes McDonald's. Now, the sentence, Dr. K is 183 centimeters tall, you just have to measure my height, and that will tell you whether this is true or not. What about the sentence, Dr. K likes McDonald's? How would we test the sentence? How do we know whether this is true or false? I want to give you a little bit of time to think about that. So, I think there's two basic ideas that people will come up with. One is, you could ask me, do I like McDonald's? Let's say I say yes. Does that mean it's true? Second one, does Dr. K often eat at McDonald's? Does that mean it's true? The first idea depends on me telling the truth, or me knowing myself well enough to know the truth. So for instance, I could claim that I really enjoy listening to Arashi. It could be the case that I do, it could be the case that I don't. I could be completely wrong about this. I might not actually know myself. The second idea. Let's change it from McDonald's to cauliflower. So let's say I do eat cauliflower every day. Let's say that I'm eating it every single day. That doesn't necessarily mean that I like it. First, as I suggest here, I could be getting paid $1,000 a week to eat cauliflower. That actually would not guarantee that I like it. It could be that I just like getting $1,000 a week, so I eat something I don't like. In the same way, it could be the case that I'm just trying to trick you. Or maybe my doctor told me I will die if I do not eat cauliflower every week. So this is the sort of thing we have to think about. There's a third option. The third option is we can do a brain scan, and we can figure out if my brain waves are the same as the brain waves that equal liking. If that is the case, then we could say I like it, but there's a couple problems here as well. One problem is what we think about, the idea of getting inside of people's heads. The other is if there is a particular set of brain waves that equals like. So to be on the safe side in this class, I'm going to avoid using subjective statements because they have these problems and these potential issues. I'm not saying they're not statements. I'm merely saying that they are a more complex type of statement than measuring things like, is this a blue tie. All right. Thank you for listening to this video. I look forward to your comments and questions if you're taking it in class. Remember that participation is a major part of this class. If you don't ask questions, the class doesn't work. I do not need to learn this material again. I am here because you are supposed to learn this material. So thank you for your time and attention.